This video is going to be very long, but if you're planning to buy MSI Creator 15 OLED, I strongly advise you to watch the whole video carefully, because there are a lot to talk about. And for easier navigation, use timestamps below. And damn, it was hard to put everything in one single video, so it is comprehensible enough for other people to watch. Also, I want to mention that I didn't buy this laptop for a review or anything. My intentions were basically get a laptop, get a good laptop for the money I'm paying, good and reliable tool, so I'm not wasting any more time transferring data from one piece of crap to another. And this video is practically my user experience with MSI Creator 15 OLED. Experience from a real user. MSI Creator 15 OLED is my second attempt to get a laptop with OLED display. And my first attempt was a Gigabyte Aero 15 OLED. And it was a complete garbage. There is a video I made about it as well, so definitely check it out. Kept losing connection. Specifications of both laptops, I would say, identical. So is the way they are being advertised by manufacturers. So there is a chance that you are choosing between those two laptops right now. I do not have any particular feelings about Creator 15 OLED design. It's basically a subtle black box with a screen and a keyboard, without emphasis on any part of it. No red stripes, no RGB logos, no anything. Laptop sits on the table damn firmly, not wobbling, not shaking. Because of that boxiness, there is not much distance between the bottom lid of the laptop and the table. And it affects you know what. More of that later. Placement of those speakers is retarded. They are basically two slits on the keyboard deck. Dust and dirt, particle of your skin and other gross stuff just falling in there. And they are easily covered with your hands. There are two USB-C ports, one on each side of the laptop, and it is nice. One of them, according to MSI, is a Thunderbolt 4 and supports power delivery charging. I don't have any compatible cables to test this, but for sure this laptop can charge other devices, for example, like my Pixel 4. Other ports are located on each side of the laptop as well, and uh, there are no ports on the back at all, which is not nice. If the laptop is sitting on the table and a lot of cables connected, it is a complete disaster. Those cables are getting in the way of my hands constantly. I put my external keyboard behind the laptop, so my elbow is on the table, and uh, I have to throw power cable over my damn wrist. Come on! There are ports which no way should be located on the sides of any laptop in the first place, such as power supply port, HDMI, Ethernet and a couple of USBs for external mouse and keyboard. All those bulky ports should be on the back side, like in Lenovo Legion 5, for example. More than that, they're too close to each other and sometimes I just can't insert a regular USB drive, other cables just will not let me do it. And I'm not even talking about those SD cards adapters, which are completely necessary, because, funny thing, it doesn't have a SD card slot. Even that trashy Gigabyte Aero 15 OLED has a SD card reader, but that creator's laptop does not. Yeah.
well, I have not a single clue what this laptop is really made of, but whatever it is, it is no harder than a damn tin foil. The screen is literally curved, so is the laptop itself. It makes creaking alarming noises all over the place. And it bends very easy. This material the laptop is made of is too flimsy for that kind of device. I mean, really, what kind of crap is it made of? Probably it was me somehow, since I doubt that it came from the factory this way, but I really do not remember how and when it could even happen. To fix it, and I'm not even sure if it can be fixed, the motherboard should be removed completely, and that I am not willing to do. Power connector itself is wobbling like hell, and it's just a matter of time when I gotta resolder that thing. The hinge is creaking too, feels loose and flimsy. But despite of it, the screen doesn't wobble at all, no matter how much I have got to say to someone on the internet. Funny enough, if I just hold this laptop in hands, if I close the lid and just hold it like this, like a little baby or whatever, it feels really nice by some reason nice, heavy and sturdy and firmly whatever. And it is really weird considering that it is built no better than an American house. The laptop is pretty hard to get inside to the extent that it is possible to tell if the laptop was opened before or not. Material the laptop is made of is incredibly soft, even plastic tools are leaving marks. If you look carefully enough, the laptop is basically screaming that someone was shoving stuff inside those little gaps here and there, trying to open the back lid. And just imagine if I'd use a metal tools instead, it would be a complete mess. Inside there is a Samsung PM9A1 NVMe SSD, which is a OEM version of Samsung 980 Pro. A surprise to be sure, but a welcome one. Also, there is a chunk of thermal pad stuck on the backside of the SSD, which is another good surprise, as it helps to transfer the heat away from it. As a Wi-Fi card, Killer 1675X is installed. And with both SSD and Wi-Fi, there are a couple of caveats. But more of it later. There are also two RAM sticks, which can be replaced. And as you probably already noticed, there are three fans inside. And that fact doesn't really help the matter. But more of that... Well, you know, later. Before I proceed to describe my experience with the laptop, I need to make clear that OS situation here. Out of the box, Windows 10 was installed with some Wear as a bonus. 
Instead, I installed a clean version of uh, Windows 11 from USB drive created with Microsoft Media Creation Tool, but I kept the partition with MSI Factory Recovery Image intact. Keep that in mind just for a little bit. I haven't had a very pleasant experience with Windows 11, so maybe after a couple of weeks I decided to get back to Windows 10, but uh, that decided is more like wiping the drive in anger because nothing was working properly. And here where recovery parts comes in. Absolutely the same story as with Gigabyte Aero 15 OLED. There is an official instruction how to recover from factory image, but that option is missing. There is a tool supposed to fix it, which of course not fixing anything, though it even says that fixing is successful. There is even an 18 pages PDF with instructions how to create recover backup on those laptops which come with MSI Control Center pre-installed. But this option is missing too, even though, as you remember, recovery partition is intact. Maybe, just maybe this option is present when, if Windows was never been reinstalled. But at this point, I do not care completely. And in the end of this video, I will try to explain why. Anyway, a recovery partition here is useless. The only thing it does is taking 20 gigs of your storage. You can't recover anything from that partition. You can't download factory image anywhere from the internet as well. I even got in touch with the company and was told by MSI that I need to go to the local MSI service center and let their engineers install it for me. Yeah. I wanted to elaborate this problem even further in this video, but it's already too damn long, so I'm going to make a separate one comparing recoveries of different manufacturers and my thoughts on how recovery should be. So there is no easy way to reinstall Windows on this MSI Creator 15 OLED. The only thing is left is installing vanilla version of Windows and then wasting another hour diligently, like a good boy or girl, installing every driver available from the laptop's official webpage, following those demo instructions and hoping that you will not miss anything and everything is going to be working properly. So everything I will talk about in this video apply to clean Windows 10 installation with all available drivers on the MSI website installed by hand, with BIOS updated to the latest and with all updates Windows update has found. The keyboard doesn't have a numpad. Someone will miss it for sure, but it's only a 15-inch laptop, so cramming numpad into the chassis is not a really good idea. Like again, Gigabyte did with Aero. It looks a lot cleaner without it, and the keyboard is centered. Aero keys are not separated from the rest of the keyboard. Trying to find them in the dark is annoying. The same goes about function key. It is basically lost in a crowd and uh, again, it takes a lot of time to find it in the dark. There is a bright LED in the right upper corner of the keyboard and it annoys me. I couldn't figure out how to disable it. And if you do know how, please let me know in the comments. I mean, it's not really comfortable holding my finger there all the time trying to cover it while I'm watching something in the dark. Function key lighting up, arrow keys and function row. Apart F1 key. Keyboard in general, nice, pleasant to type on. I do not like the touchpad here. Pretty often it registers clicks. I feel like I never made 
Sometimes I even drag my files without realizing it and then I find them in random folders on my computer and if you move some important files like this, for example in some system folder, I doubt you find those files ever again. I do not trust this touchpad completely, but it is not the worst I ever used, especially knowing which touchpads other Windows laptops have. At first I didn't like that wide aspect ratio of this touchpad, trackpad, whatever you want to call it, but actually it is not that bad, especially for scrolling timeline, for example. Anyway, the moment I put the laptop on the table, I connect to mouse. As I mentioned, it has a killer 1675X Wi-Fi card inside. Killer is an Intel sub-brand, like for example Alienware from Dell. And I always have problems with those killer cards. Story time! <laughs> About 8 years ago, I had my first MSI laptop. It was uh, MSI G72P Apache Pro. When I bought it, internet wasn't working completely. I mean, it was working, but it was so damn slow. I spent a lot of time trying to figure out the problem there. I even had a technician, internet guy, coming over to my house who ended up telling me that uh, my new shiny laptop is the problem here. Anyway, I spend uh, a lot more time trying to figure out what is wrong and that wrong turned out to be that killer control center. After disabling everything in that killer control center, my internet started to work as it's supposed to and the history repeats itself. My second MSI laptop and internet not working properly. It takes forever to load a single page. Anyway, the moment I saw that killer icon, it was just like, pam, I realized what is causing the problem here. The same killer control center. And after disabling every little optimizer, in that program, everything went back to normal and uh, now the internet is working as it's supposed to in the first place without any problems, nice and reliable. Those stupid optimizers supposed to reduce lag or whatever, but the only thing they reduce is my connection speed. So if you have problems with your internet as well and uh, there is that killer control center installed on your computer, well, you know what to do. There are two slots for SSD available inside. One is Gen 4, another one is Gen 3. Out of the box, a Gen 4 slot is occupied with this OEM Samsung 980 Pro. And out of the box, write speeds are a joke and uh, fluctuate very much. It was noticeable even in everyday usage. It just felt slow and unresponsive even before I ran any benchmarks and knew that something is wrong. On the screen is a rough comparison of stock SSD to the retail 2TB Samsung 980 Pro installed in the same slot. Anyway, there is a thread on Reddit and there is a firmware update for that OEM 980 Pro inside. So here is a rough comparison of before and after firmware update, but only in PCIe Gen 3 slot. After update, speed seemed to be more stable and uh, I do not remember having any problems with it anymore though I'm using it as a second drive now. I don't know where this update is coming from, but it seems to be legit from Samsung. So if you're going to update your SSD, remember to keep the caps of your files. Samsung SSD Magician does not recognize stock SSD. And it sucks. Though it is OEM SSD, I think that it should still be supported by official software because in the end, it is the end user who suffers and for all the companies involved here is not a good thing. Well, let me explain why. If the SSD inside or everything else basically is not working properly inside the laptop, well, 
the regular user is not going to even f try to figure out what causes the problem here. It's going to be much simpler situation for him or her. They just not going to buy SSD from Samsung ever again. They just will buy SSD from another manufacturer instead, just because they had a bad experience with it in this particular laptop. So my point is, the end user is not going to blame the laptop manufacturer only for putting that bad SSD inside the laptop, but also manufacturer of this bad SSD. So OEM SSDs should be supported by official software for the sake of user, for the sake of laptop manufacturer and for the sake of SSD manufacturer, of course. The first thing I checked, if the panel model is the same as uh, it was in Gigabyte Aero 15 LED, and it is not, though according to hardware info, panels were made at the same time, but model numbers are different. The panel is bright, it has a lot of saturation, a lot of contrast, and playing games and watching some HDR stuff, yes it does support HDR, in complete darkness is just stunning experience. The window saw is Intel Graphics Command Center reporting that the panel is 10-bit, but I checked a couple of different gradients and could not tell the difference between 8 and 10 bits. Maybe those 10 bits are fake or maybe I did something wrong and could not set up that 10 bit output properly. Anyway, if you have any additional info on that matter, please let me know in the comments. Dithering is still present. Not the deal breaker in general, but sometimes it is really annoying. On gray gradients, it is especially noticeable. The image looks very noisy, basically just a mess of red, green, and blue dust, if you look closely enough. On Gigabyte Aero 15 OLED, that black crash was a complete disaster. There were no details in the near black gradients at all, especially on lower brightness. Here, the matter is much better. I'm not saying that it is perfect, but I'm saying that it is good enough, so I wouldn't consider it is a huge problem anymore. Details are preserved quite okay, even on minimum brightness. Again, image is overexposed, so do not mind the noise. I failed to show that black crash properly in my Aero 15 OLED video, so I hope this time it is more obvious. The color is not consistent throughout the whole brightness scale. Gray gradients are either gray with green tint or gray with red and green tint. They are never just gray. A lot of, if not all, OLED panels suffer from this problem at some degree. Here, for example, huge jump between colors or tints, whatever you want to call it, on 66 brightness and 65 brightness. On 65 it has a image with green tint and on 66 it has a red and green tint. 66 65 66 65 The same with 38 39 38 39 29 30 29 30 29 30 17 18 17 18, 17, 18. And the last of very noticeable ones I found between 14 and 13. 13, 14, 13, 14. Other transitions between brightness levels are not that jumpy, but still every brightness level has that green tint with either green or with green and red tint. Green tint is always present, but to be honest, it is not that noticeable until you look for it or compare side by side to something with proper colors. I don't have any professional equipment right now to back up my words, 
But come on, I ain't no need equipment, any equipment, just to see that the screen is damn green. It's solid, it doesn't have backlight, so it needs to be calibrated on every brightness level, so the colors are nice and consistent. Of course, I accept that possibility that on some particular brightness level there are no tints, no any color shifts, and the color is correct. But that 66 pages laptop manual doesn't say anything about the brightness level. I should use this display so I have a consistent and correct colors without any tints and other stupid stuff that shouldn't even be here in the first place. I would compare the tint to the notch on your smartphone. If you're looking on it, is there, but the moment you start to scroll some stupid pictures on Reddit, it kinda blends in. But don't get me wrong, the fact that it's even all over the surface and it's not that noticeable does make it a good thing, considering that it is a creator's laptop and any kind of tents are just unacceptable. And that sticker that says that delta is less than 2, which is supposed to mean that any color shifts and any color deviations are not noticeable with human eye. So why the hell am I noticing those color shifts and those color deviations and that green tint with my damn eyes? If I would really care about the result, I'm getting, I wouldn't trust that creator's 4K OLED display here. If you watched my video on Gigabyte Aero 15 OLED, you definitely remember this thing. And MSI Creator 15 OLED, good to know, doesn't have it, at least in my unit. But it has some of that green bleeding by the edges. Not severe, but still present. On the one hand, it is good to know that uh, that bleeding is not severe. But on the other hand, uh, I'm happy because my display is not a complete trash, though it's supposed to be color correct and professionally calibrated and stuff. In this case, something is definitely wrong. Again, as any other OLED display, brightness here is adjusted with pulse width modulation or PWM. The screen is flickering like crazy and in the best case it causes eye strain. In the worst case scenario it causes deterioration of your health sooner or later in the future. Means this display is just not suitable to stare for a long time. And we are talking about creator's workstation right now. In Aero 15, all that factory calibration nonsense was just a bunch of retarded ICC profiles, which are gone forever if you reinstall Windows and forget about them. Here is retarded MSI True Color instead. Dedicated software to manage colors on the display. It even affects full screen programs, which makes sense probably if you think about it since the whole image is being chewed and spit out by the Intel graphics anyway. So, when MSI True Color is installed and 10-bit option in Intel Graphics Common Center is enabled, there are artifacts on the screen. If I choose 8-bit and MSI True Color is installed, the screen is flickering, like turning off and back on, flashing black, or even maybe like switching between integrated and dedicated graphics for some reason. If I uninstall MSI True Color, both options, 8-bit and 10-bit, are working fine. No flickering, no artifacts. But at the same time, I have a video where there is no MSI True Color icon present, but the screen still flickers. Maybe it's just that the icon is not showing yet. Since it needs two restarts of the laptop to be installed properly, that MSI True Color, according to the instruction. So, I try to figure out what exactly causing those problems here. I have no idea. 
completely not a single clue. I wasted enough time for it and not going to waste any more. At this point I have no idea what is causing that flickering and artifacts. I will just say in general that somehow that MSI True Color and Intel Graphics Common Center or whatever, somehow they are not compatible. Not fully compatible at least. Deleting that MSI True Color is fixing that problem entirely and both, as I said, 8-bit and 10-bits options are working fine. And of course, there's an instruction on how to delete that MSI True Color properly. Weird thing happened once. Everything just turned yellow. It scared me a little bit, but after restarting, everything was back to normal. If I had to guess, it is again has something to do with them, that MSI True Color. But honestly, I do not remember if it was installed at the moment or not. MSI Control Center is another useless, stupid, good for nothing, messing with your computer, doing who knows what. Piece of crap, Control Center. There are four performance profiles in that MSI Control Center high performance balanced, silent and super battery. But if you click on that battery icon in the taskbar, there are another four performance modes, which makes total of 16 performance modes. Why? With auto, default, fun curves, none of performance modes is comfortable to use. In balanced and high performance mode, those fans are always on, they never shut up, and you're just getting tired of that constant noise. But far more annoying is that they, as it feels, kick in randomly. It is applied to every performance mode at some degree, but the silent mode is the special one here. In silent mode, the CPU fan is set to minimum, constant and pretty quiet, but the GPU fans turn on and off just randomly, even if the laptop is barely warm to touch. No, shut up. The hell? This. Why? Just why? You never guess when they're turning on next time, it is so damn annoying if you want just to sit and quietly work. That irregularity and anticipation can drive anyone crazy. But in high performance mode, it is possible to manually control fan curve. And if on Gigabyte Aero 15 OLED that fan curve control was completely useless, here it is completely useless as well. Because of three things. First, in high performance mode, CPU is unlocked, which means that it will boost its clock speeds until it reaches some particular temperature. Let's call it 
hot as hell. Second, when the laptop hits another particular temperature threshold, in order to cool itself, it forces the fans up to the maximum. Let's call it loud as hell. Third, the temperature presser reaches when it can't boost itself anymore. Seems to be exactly the temperature when the fans start spinning on maximum speeds. And those three facts combined mean that because CPU is unlocked, it will boost itself until it hits that critical temperature. And hitting that critical temperature makes the fans start spinning on maximum speeds. In the real world, it means that no matter how nicely you adjust that fan curve, the moment you put some load on the CPU, the system just disregards your retarded fan curve and cracks the fans up to the maximum. Therefore, all that said makes that manual fan curve control in high performance mode completely useless thing. And other performance modes where presser is not unlocked and there is a much lower thermal limit do not have a manual fan curve control. But the worst thing about all this is that though everything I just said seems to be true, it is not always the case. The fans may kick in disregarding your fan curve and may not kick in and follow that damn fan curve. High performance, advanced, because well, in any other performance mode you cannot adjust fan speeds. GPU are 70, 80, 85. CPU speeds are set to minimum or minimum whatever, 1% save. I'm going to show you that eventually CPU fans still going to kick in. Right now it's GPU fans and it's already hot. Anyway, and it's already on. So, I'm trying to say that that fan control basically useless or not. Yep, it is useless, even though you said that fan curve to minimum at every single point, fans are still kicking. High performance mode, fan set to auto, Cinebench R23. Average Intel Core i7-11800H scores about 15 100 point single core and 12,000 multi core. And here, MSI Creator 1508 comes in 1419 single core, 9044 multi core. I checked everything I could, retested several times, results are consistent. 11800H in MSI Creator 1508 has worse performance than average 11400H which scores about 1400 single core and uh, 9200 multi core. But there is more. I got those numbers when the laptop in that said desktop mode and uh, there is enough of airflow. But uh, when I put the laptop on the table, like any other regular laptop, situation is even worse. Though single core result does not change, multi core score loses another 600 points. Yeah. CPU overheats really, really bad. In everyday usage, before it can cool itself, CPU temperatures can get as high as 102 degrees. 102 degrees. When the load is constant and sustained for a long time, CPU temps settle on 94 degrees. Means on 95 degrees it starts to throttle. More than that, that overheating causes stuttering. Laptop freezes for a second and then does everything it was asked for in a snap. Cooling system just can't handle those temperature spikes and uh, presser throttles in mere attempt to cool itself, dropping, 
clock speeds very, very bad. This processor just impossible to cool in the chassis, overheats instantly and throttles. Even keeping that cooler boost on will not help at all. The CPU will always throttle, always. And balanced mode is completely the same. GPU inside, so the CPU is heavily cut down. It is only 95 watts, NVIDIA RTX 3060. In other laptops it can go up 115 watts. But at least it is specified on the website that it's only 95 watts. Can't blame them for it. But even with 95 watts it gets very hot. You can expect about 85 or even 90 degrees if you are using this laptop as a regular laptop, putting it straight on the table. It just chokes because of lack of airflow. But if the laptop is in a desktop mode, means that it's upside down, therefore a lot of fresh air comes in. GPU temperatures are stable at 74 or 75 degrees, with fans only at 50%. For gaming in 1080p, performance of this laptop is going to be enough for a lot of people, even in newer games. Old games, on the other hand, work fine even if 4K is enabled. So if you're like me, playing mostly old titles, this laptop is going to be more than fine to game on. But if you're going to get a maximum performance out of this GPU, you need to connect external monitor because this laptop doesn't have a Mac switch and the graphic goes through Intel. But in this case you are literally leaving this OLED display on the table. The main reason why you bought or going to buy this laptop for. RAM situation here is tricky because it is usually depends. But considering that it is a creator's laptop, well, you are going to create some stuff on it, right? And creating stuff usually takes a lot of RAM. And 16 gigs of it may not be enough. So just pop this thing open and upgrade the RAM. And what am I going to do with those two sticks that are already inside? To just keep them in a drawer? To sell them? And if I have to return the laptop? If you want to tell me to shut up already and that I should have bought a 32 or 64 gigs versions in the first place, well, I can't. Because there's no any. Basically, that laptop only comes with 16 gigs of RAM. Yeah. Creators laptops that comes only with 16 gigs of RAM. Cool. I'm not going to invent anything new. I'm just going to start DaVinci Resolve, scrub around the timeline, disable enable stuff and see how it's going to behave. The laptop in high performance mode, then set to auto and here it is set to best performance. Right now we are running DaVinci Resolve and hardware info. Also I want to start task manager and I want to track GPU memory usage. The laptop just started and they're already 6 gig used. So now we are running DaVinci Resolve. I didn't even run project, it's already 10 gigs. I'm going to run that project I just copied, so I won't mess anything in my project. 15 gigs of RAM. Some stuff is written on the SSD, 9 gigs. Of RAM is actually used. Now let's just scrub around timeline. Well, not that great, right? Mm. 
left and right, left and right, left and right. Let's click playback. So it kind of works. The end user so is not going to blame. It's not that bad, right? It's going to be much Yeah, it is kind of usable, I guess. What about our memory? Well, you see it with your own Gemini's. Twenty-seven gigs of memory is needed, and this laptop has. 16, let's grab a little bit more. And I think it stutters. Well, usable, kinda. It's still kinda stuff, right? And what about our memory? 28 gigs, okay. Well, but here's a little caveat. Basically, I select everything, right click on it. In here, we see render cache color output is on, render cache fusion output is on. And now we go to the playback menu and see use optimized media if available is on. Proxy handling, prefer proxies, fusion memory cache is on, render cache is on. <laughs> and now Let's see what's going on here. Timeline proxy resolution is set to half. Well, <laughs> the project resolution 2048 by 1080. And if we cut this in half, we are getting basically 1024 by 540 pixels. This laptop doesn't scrub that nicely even through that not even 720p footage. And now for the sake of experiment, we disable use optimized media if available, we disable all proxies, then we disable render cache, we disable fusion memory cache. Everything is disabled, timeline proxy resolution is full, but I think it's disabled anyway. And is bad. It's really bad. Now let. Yep, it's dead. Basically, it's dead. I want to start that hardware info right now and see what's going on with memory. But I think it doesn't even start. 43 gigabytes. 43. And it's dead. This laptop cannot be used without proxies at all. I am not sure if the amount of RAM is problem here or GPU RAM. Basically, this is what's happening. All the GPU RAM is used. And after a while, I'm getting messages that GPU memory is not enough. Here, basically, what I was getting. Your GPU memory is full. Your GPU memory is full. Your GPU memory is full. Full. A lot of those stupid notifications. And now I want to recreate what happened just for the sake of fun. So now the reduction, better, smell, whatever. And that thing is okay, I guess, or not. Let me check. Uh, kind of okay. Well, let's park it right here. Add node, it's it will be 4. I'm applying the flickering. Applying the flickering. And we see what's going on here. It's suffering. Listen. This thing is just suffering. But still, in somehow. Oh my head. Oh my head. Let's close it and remove noise with oopsie oopsie yep and it's gone again 
DaVinci Resolve original project. I'm opening it. And, and it's gone. Take two, this one. I'm running it. It's still running. And it's gone. Now it was. I ran this project and then Gate Man's backup. It ran and it's fucking dead for real. What the hell is even that? Well, that is your Gem Creator laptop. And more than that, RAM usage. Here, 26 gigs, 37, 56, 76 gigs of RAM is used. <laughs> anyway, let's start that DaVinci Resolve once again. And now let's see what's going on with that GPU memory. We disable all the proxies, disable full render cache none, fusion memory cache off. It just dies, GPU memory is full, it uses some of the RAM. Basically it has only 16 gigs of RAM without proxies. This laptop cannot be used in this DaVinci Resolve thing. And considering that it is a creator's laptop, I bet a lot of people were going to use this laptop for working in DaVinci Resolve. And here it is. This laptop has only 16 gigs of RAM and 6 gigs of GPU memory. I'm not sure if increasing amount of RAM will help, but I ordered 64 gigs of RAM for this thing. And after some time, I'm definitely making a video to see if this thing helps. And right now I cannot use this laptop working in DaVinci Resolve without proxy at all. One more thing I want to show you here. There that clip where I'm showing those damn tents on the screen. I mean, this screen is flickering, so I want to deflicker the footage, right? Decompose to original. Then, compose in place using clips only. Here, what's going on? I understand that this scenario is pretty rare, but I need, I just need right now to show you those damn tents properly and look in this flickering it is just not cool. So what do I need? I need to go to the color page and I need to deflicker this thing. 11 4K streams. So I go to here, deflicker, I apply this thing. So does it play? I click spacebar and it instantly dies. I only apply one damn deflicker effect. Now let's see what's going on with GPU RAM. 5.1 out of 6. Anyway, let's go to the second clip. Deflicker. Okay. Okay, I think it is dead already. Yep, it's dead already. 4K downscale to 720p. All proxies are activated and this thing just doesn't allow me to apply anything on those damn clips. Basically not fulfilling its own destiny to allow me to create. Right now I have a real life scenario. I need to show you those damn tents. And I can't. I just can't do everything I wanted on this machine. But to be honest, I tried the same thing with my computer where there's a 3070 Ti and 32 gigs of RAM and I was getting the same GPU memory is not enough notifications and I wasn't be able to render this clip out. And it just dies, really just it dies. It's only those damn clips and it just dies. But as I said, I ordered 64 gigs of RAM for this thing and I'm going to make a separate video about upgrading this thing and especially trying to do this exact part of the video. But even if we forget about this exact part, 
I'm going to say that working in that DaVinci Resolve on this laptop without proxies is just not possible. As I said, I doubt that there's a computer, at least consumer-grade computer, which can render this thing at all. So here I have an assignment for you. 10 4K streams. And I want to deflicker it. You see what's going on? I was able to deflicker it even on this laptop, but the experience was not great and the results are not great as well. I take first clip, apply grade to it, render this thing out. Then I get a rendered clip, put another clip, apply the flicker to this clip and render those two stripes, third stripe and so on so on. I spent about 30 minutes doing this and there are three more clips which need to be deflickered and I just don't want to do this. One clip is enough. So what kind of assignment I'm talking about? To figure out if there are any computers which can render this thing or maybe I'm just asking too much. 10 4K streams and I need to deflicker it properly applying effect to all streams at the same time and then render it out and not rendering one little stripe at the time and then layering all those 10 together. I will put a link to this project, you download it and you try to deflicker one clip at a time and then let us know when your computer dies. So let's check settings. Playback, use optimized media available, is on. Proxy handling, prefer proxies, timeline resolution quarter, render cache smart, fusion memory cache auto, then edit page, render cache fusion output auto, render cache color output is on. Shift 8, export video, quick time, H265, native, 4K DCI, timeline resolution, 4K DCI, quality, best, encoding profile, main, keyframes, automatic, frame rewarding disable, square auto, same as project, force size into highest quality, force bar. basically look at those settings and choose the same. So what do you do? You look for the flicker, apply to the first clip, then you go to here, shift 8, add to render queue, render. 23 seconds then again color page second clip the flicker shift 8 add to render queue replace render and it's dead yep basically one clip one deflickered clip this thing can handle and when I apply another deflickering thing it just dies 36 gigs it wants 36 gigs of RAM anyway let's try one more time shift 8 but I think it's dead already yep one clip and it dies so I want to know how much clips your computer can handle especially I want to know how much those damn clips can new MacBook Pros deflicker, especially the one with 16 gigs of unified RAM. And of course, if someone watches this and has a new Mac with 64 gigs of unified RAM, I want to know how well this thing behaves there. Yeah, basically, that's it. You try to deflicker this thing and then share with me in the comments how much were you able to deflicker and of course specifications of your computer, how much video memory does it have and how much RAM and we'll figure out if this even possible. If the laptop is unplugged and running on battery, it drops another 5 to 6% of CPU performance. I still do not understand why Windows laptops drop performance like this when running only from battery. If you are going to tell me that on battery there's just not enough GIS that goes into the CPU, then please explain me why the hell it drops another 5 watts even if it's running in that super battery mode, if it's already consumes only 15 watts of power. I mean, you're telling me that the laptop, that the battery inside the laptop can supply enough power to run in high performance mode where 
the laptop consumes 45 watts, but it can't handle 20 watts in super battery mode. I don't know, it sounds really fishy. This thing is running on battery now. It is in high performance mode with fans set to auto. I'm opening task manager and let's see what's going on. It says 12 gigs in years, but 35 is committed. Dedicated GPU memory, 5.8 out of 6 gigs. Shared memory, 2.4 out of 7.9, 8.2 in general. Let's go to the edit patch and play. This video is going to be very long, but 16. if you're planning to buy MSI Creator 1511, it is lagging, I strongly as you see. advise you in one single It is video. lagging so very, very, very bad. Enough. Right now, on that clip, there are only a couple simple effects like contrast, tint, white balance, that's all. Nothing more. Pretty simple basic not even a great just simple color correction and it's getting loud very very loud render cache is on proxy handling prefer proxies let's disable all the effects this video is going to be very long but if you're planning to buy msi creator and it is still lagging i strongly advise you to watch the whole video why carefully i don't know there maybe a lot I don't know, it's just, zero navigation, it's just lagging, and that's all. RAM is not enough, hard GPU memory is not enough. Video, Basically, so it's enough for still lagging, even without also, any effects. Here, we are at least 3 gigs of GPU memory so short. Even 8 gigs is not going to be enough. Lagging really, really bad. Lagging really, really bad. Very, very bad without any effects. In high performance mode and that battery icon in the system tray set to best performance, you can expect about four and a half hours of battery life, working with documents, browsing, YouTube videos, movies and stuff. I mean, everyday usage, four and a half hours of battery life. When I connect or disconnect external display, the laptop is starting to lag, to stutter, and I need to restart it to make the lagging go away, basically. If I have an external monitor connected and uh, I want to go somewhere with the laptop, I need to disconnect loads of cables first and then I need to restart the laptop so it won't lag. Otherwise, I cannot use it properly at all. The same goes about connecting monitor, the system lagging until I restart. So I connected the monitor, I need to restart the laptop, I disconnected the monitor, I need to restart the laptop. You got the idea. Every time I connect or disconnect external monitor, I need to restart the laptop. Such a great user experience. Setting everything up every single time. Even more great user experience. Sleep mode here just doesn't work, no matter if I close the lid or if I click that slip button in the Windows menu. Screen turns off, fans stop spinning and a couple of minutes later, then spin back on again. They turn off, they turn on, they turn off, then turn on. It is very, very annoying. I checked every setting. I checked a lot of stuff, really. It's so damn annoying and turn out it just doesn't sleep. I googled it and it is a widespread problem on MSI laptops, so I ended up using hibernation instead. Of course, it takes a lot more time to wake this thing from hibernation than from sleep, but listening to this thing turn off and on fans randomly when it's supposed to be sleeping is far more annoying. Also, I cannot wake this thing from the hibernation using my external keyboard and if it 
and that's it desktop mode i have to go to the laptop and slightly open the lid otherwise it just won't run and press that power button Before I made any conclusions, I need to clarify that operation system situation here a little bit more. There is a chance that out of the box with factory image, some of the problems I stumbled upon are not even present, such as laptop not sleeping, flickering screen when MSI True Color is installed, or lagging when connecting or disconnecting external monitor. But I believe that cleaning the drive and reinstalling Windows is just fair. Why? Because. Because sometimes the system breaks so bad that reinstalling it is the only option that left. And because MSI does not provide us with factory image, with all that drivers and but were installed to eliminate us as a variable that something may go wrong the only option reasonable option left is installing clean version of windows from official microsoft website and then installing every single driver available by hand hoping that we will not miss anything and everything is going to be working properly because going to the MSI local service center, I wouldn't consider an option at all, especially for those people to whom the local nearest one is on the other side of the ocean. I'm trying to say that eventually, sooner or later, Windows will be reinstalled. Will it be you or someone else who is going to be using this laptop after you? Anyway, someone will find him or her exactly in this situation. The point of recovery is to recover factory image of the system, recover it to the factory state. If everything went to hell and if it did, how am I going to create that recovery image if system is not working, if that image is not intact anymore, if I wiped out drive completely when I'm buying the laptop and take it out of the box, I shouldn't care that the first thing I have to do is to create backup of recovery image in some random program in some hidden menu. And if I forget to do this, I will not be able to recover from that image anymore if I didn't create that recovery image the moment I took the laptop out of the box. It's just stupid and so many levels and I should not care about this at all. I paid money, so I need and I want an easy, an easy and foolproof option to recover the factory state of the laptop with all the drivers and stuff available if something goes really wrong. But instead of smooth and seamless recovery, I ended up installing clean version of Windows and then installing those stupid drivers by hand. I mean, dozens of pages of those retarded instructions, four pages instructions how to install MSI True Color, 12 page troubleshooting, why that MSI True Color may not be working, 18 pages how to create backup of the factory image. I mean, all that stuff just to make it work at least somehow acceptable. Reading dozens of pages of those stupid instructions. Just look what people do to recover that stupid recovery. How they waste their time in vain. It's just not right. It shouldn't be like this. I mean, it's stupid. It's just mockery and disrespect to the customer. So, if something is not working on this laptop, I blame the manufacturer MSI in this case, because I did everything I could to make this thing work, and even more than I should. Well, I have really strong, though mixed, feelings about this laptop. If you compare it to MS, MSI to Gigabyte Air 15 OLED, it is obvious that Gigabyte 
is not even an option here. In MSI, Wi-Fi is working, there's no that severe green color bleeding, at least in my unit, and it doesn't wobble when you're typing. So let's just say that MSI Creator 15 OLED is straight better than Gigabyte Aero 15 OLED, or more precisely that Gigabyte Aero 15 OLED is a pure piece of trash and should not even exist in the first place. So we better forgot about this thing forever. But if something is better, doesn't mean that it's any good. So, actually, it was supposed to be a kindly different conclusion. I was going to go over again those things I talked about in this video. But come on, I'm so damn tired. Yes, that is the point of my conclusion. I'm so tired of this thing. I do not even want to talk about this laptop anymore. Right now, it's there basically where it belongs, just on the table in that stupid set desktop mode, because using this thing as a laptop is a horrible experience. This thing is loud as hell, extremely loud, fans won't shut up, they kick in randomly, turn off randomly, turn on randomly, they think just too unpredictable, too unpredictable. And the main problem with this screen is the display. Yes, it is weird that considering it is supposed to be main selling point of this device, but basically it is the main deal breaker, I would say so. Maybe I am so damn sensitive to this PWM flickering stuff. But as I were saying countless of times, if you do not feel strain at the moment, it still affects your brain because of the way how Yes, how our brain works, how our body works in general, and that constant flickering is just not good. And the amount of time I'm wasted on this thing, installing those stupid drivers, reading stupid instructions, <sighs> come on. And yes, this laptop can be used at some point. It's a regular laptop, but it is not a regular laptop. It is practically it is named, it's supposed to be creator's laptop, reliable tool, reliable machine for people who create, who do some serious stuff, who make money with this, not this vertical laptop, with this machine in the end. And it's not a reliable tool at all. And you cannot even use comfortably this display. I mean, Maybe you just ignore this fact. If you already bought this laptop, maybe you ignore this fact that display is harming your damn eyes. But think about it. Maybe you think that I'm just trashing, that I hate OLEDs. Yes, I do hate OLED displays because they're harmful. Harmful. They're very harmful for our health for mine and yours. There are a lot of studies on this topic, so Google it. And if you already bought this laptop, you can do stuff, Wi-Fi works, but come on, why do I need this Wi-Fi? If the best option for this laptop is sitting right here, like this, I just don't want to use this a lot. The moment I put this thing on a table, the fence start spinning like crazy, it's very loud, the screen burn of my damn eyes, I just do not want to use this thing. And it's supposed to be a creator's machine for professional. For them professionals. Come on, it's so damn stupid. Yes, I'm just running right now, but... In the end, this thing, this tool, is supposed to be your tool, yes. And give you some emotions. I mean, it's supposed to be a good, reliable tool you enjoy using. And if you are not enjoy using this thing, how are you supposed to create something? I just want to say, this thing is not a creator's laptop. It's not a professional machine. The best scenario for this thing is just sitting right here, like this, in that stupid desktop mode. And if it's sitting on your table all the time, connected to external monitor, TV, television in my case, why the hell do you need this in the first place then? This OLED display, and uh, comparing to Gigabyte Air, for example, there, as we're said, Wi-Fi is not working, but 
you do not need the Gemini Wi-Fi if it's anyway connected to the Ethernet cable. In short, this laptop doesn't make any sense, though it's far better than Gigabyte Aero 15. Like, if you haven't bought this laptop yet, just don't, please. Just don't, really. <sighs> just don't, please. OLED display is not something that actual creator, actual professional who spends a lot of time at the computer wants to get. This thing is damn harmful for your eyes and more than that. Come on, those tins, those color shifts, professional machine, even... <laughs> it's so stupid, I don't just don't want to talk anymore. Just do not buy this laptop. So, super short version. If you already bought this laptop, well, it's not the worst thing you could do. You can attach it, this to external monitor and comfortably use it. Still, you can do your job done. But if you still haven't bought this thing, just don't. Just fucking don't. If, exactly, if you're a professional, you do not need. It's the worst thing you probably can do right now is buy the laptop with OLED display. Mostly because of how it affects your eyes, how it affects your health. And as said, you are professional, you stare at this thing whole day long. And staring at OLED displays all day long is super retarded thing to do. So for me, I am probably done completely with OLED displays at the moment at least. Maybe mini LED, micro LED, whatever comes next will be something to care about. But right now, I am strongly advise you not to buy any professional machine and even consumer machine with OLED display because those stupid OLED displays in laptops yes we are talking about laptops right now are flicking like hell you are probably watching this a professional guy or girl who want who want who want who want a good laptop to do stuff done but there you are getting this yeah sorry the best thing I can do is to prevent you from buying this crap. Not exactly crap per se, but this solid display. I'm going to make a separate video, basically the video for Masai, because I think at some point it still can be fixed. Well, you cannot fix that retarded OLED display, you cannot fix that build quality, but that recovery stuff and uh, sleep issues and other stupid random things which just waste your damn time in vain, they still can be fixed with some software updates. So that's probably it. Though I still have so much to talk about so much coming from inside about this thing mostly frustration and disappointment yeah if you really made this far thank you for watching as i said it was a really hard video to make basically you are getting this laptop as with a desktop variant of it well i don't know, I'm safe Tire, I don't want to talk about this.